Are we actually live? Now? Hey, we're connected to uh, Sydney and Melbourne uh, tonight, and uh, welcome to everyone who's there and also dialed in from different places. And, um, so, as our slide says, Product Tank um, is a community uh, for product people by product people, and that's people who are designing and defining product. Um, we're founded back in 2010 in, in London, and now our meetups span over 175 cities globally. Um, so our mission is to provide inspiring content and supportive community for everyone here. Product designers, product definers, product owners, managers, all sorts of uh, people like that. I'm Jace Clamp, and uh, I work for Mind the Product, and that's the organization that uh, founded Product Tank uh, back there in London some years ago. So in a moment, it's going to be my pleasure to invite up Liam, uh, who's the head of product for Flake, a global ski school platform based here in Brisbane. Uh, Liam, like I said, he spoke at World Product Day, and we realized we had a, um, quite a candid topic that confronts uh, how to align design and organizational objectives. Um, as a consultant, which is my day job, product consulting, I find it to be a very relevant topic that a lot of organizations are struggling with right now. So we're very keen to uh, create conversation around that. As our events are always free, uh, we depend on the uh, generous support of our sponsors. Um, so tonight we'd like to thank Optimizely for sponsoring the live streaming for our event. Optimizely is the world's leading experimentation platform that unites product marketing and growth teams in running tests, learning, and deploying winning digital experiences every day. So if you'd like to create alignment in your organization based on actual testing and data and results, it's certainly worth checking out and it's relevant to our topic tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Liam up. Everyone across all our locations, if you want to give him a hand as he comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just uh, switch this guy right here. Cool. Hi. Uh, I've never had so many cameras and eyeballs, virtual and actual, at me at the same time, so that's pretty cool. But um, I'm excited that I do get this opportunity because I'm going to make an annoying sound with the microphone. I'm going to fix that up. Um, it's a topic I care a lot about because I think design has got a lot to contribute to the world. And I also think that sometimes we misuse that power. And I'm really passionate about creativity and design making an impact and a positive impact. And uh, so that's what I'm hoping to inspire a conversation about. I'm really hoping to have an honest conversation about the difficulties and the challenges and not just uh, the bullshit version where I stand up here and talk about how great design is and how amazing I do design or something like that, which is probably 95% of talks. So, um, here's, so I'm Liam and this is what we're about. So um, the goal here is to promote better management of design process or better management of design and better integration of design strategy. And hopefully what that means is more progress and less power games. So I'm not here to do design 101. I'm not here to evangelize about design thinking or any of that stuff. I'm here to talk about how we use that power better. So here, here's the agenda. Um, so I'm going to talk a, a bit of a background about where I'm coming from and uh, I've, I've got a pretty strong point of view. So why do I have a strong point of view and what is that point of view? Uh, and so what are the, some of the design process challenges that people that I've seen have fallen into over time? Um, and then talking about what does this even mean, design-led? We talk about this, people want to have a design-led business. Why? What does that even mean? So, uh, and some, some ego traps that come up around that. And then how do we better align design strategy with competitive strategy? Because if the design strategy is going that way, the competitive strategy is going that way, nobody's going anywhere. A couple of quick case studies, and then we're going to have a Q&A. So a bit of background. I'm going, to, I'm going to go through this fast. So stop me if, there's, if I'm going too fast, and we'll have questions at the end. So a bit of background about where I'm coming from. I've got kind of two personalities here. One is somebody who's being a product manager, has been a design strategist, being a consultant and a business person, and the other person who spent a lot of time in personal growth and mental health and, and dealing with wrestling ego. So I want to bring ego into the room because ego is always in the room. So I want to start with New Zealand because in many respects they've been smarter than us when it comes to design and we've ignored them. 
Um, so here's why I think that. So a couple of while back, they had uh, some of this going on about the early 2000s. So they were dropping down out of the OECD and they were worried about that. That was gonna affect everyone's quality of life. So they thought that's a, that's a problem. They identified a design as one of a, a number of things. When I say they, I mean the government. Identified design as a number of things that could restore them back up into the OECD. They created this program, which eventually became called Better by Design. That was the purpose of the program. It was not about designers. It was about mainstream business being more competitive by design. So here were some of the goals. So it was a very commercially driven program. Um, big goals, five years, 50 companies, five times GDP, half a million dollars in additional export revenue. Very commercially driven goals. Here are some of the results from a few years ago. This is going on, this program would be going on 20 years now, so it's not a new thing. Um, here are the, some, some of the people that were the architects of the program that I was fortunate to work with. I'm not a Kiwi, I just got to work with some smart Kiwis. Uh, so who you're looking at here is um, Ray LeBone, Peter Haythorn, Thwaite, Andrew Jones, and Stephanie Pietkovic. I'm gonna butcher her name, sorry Steph. Um, what you got there is order of New Zealand level brand and graphic design, order of New Zealand level industrial design, so worked under Henry Dreyfus, largest brand identity consultancy in Australasia, 120 staff. Um, so they're the gurus, they're the people where, if you're a designer and they walk in the room, you shit your pants because they're better than you in every way. So I got to, through pure chance, um, work with them for a while and do a completely naive, ignorant, lucky kind of apprenticeship and learn about their wisdom on how to integrate design with business so it actually makes a difference. Um, that was when I was working for the government. So my role there was to try to find a way to um, make the Queensland economy grow and Queensland manufacturing businesses in particular be more competitive through design. So and my job was steal from the Kiwis with their help and uh, <laughs> make Queensland better as a result. So I did that for four years. Um, then I was lucky enough to escape from the government and join some uh, very great um, people. Design consultancy is here in Brisbane, Joseph Mark. I'm gonna point out the Viking up the back there, Ben, who's not trying to hide, um, who still manages to talk to me after having been my boss for four years. And CM, so Joseph Mark, um, digital product and brand, and CMD, which is industrial design. So across the spectrum there, you're looking at clients from uh, like you're looking at like the future of music and, and video and things like that and entrepreneur like software entrepreneurs through to Virgin and you know hardware and blowing stuff up in mines. So it was quite a broad mix of clients I was kind of exposed to there. After three or four years of being a consultant, I, I kind of got I just wanted to build. I didn't want to hand over and then not have accountability to get to see something grow. So I got the opportunity to, to join Flake. So Flake, I'll tell you a bit more about Flake later. Point is I'm four years there as head of product and brand for a company that we do um, technology for ski schools in North America, hardware and software. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. So here's the point of view. So there's some, there's some hard truths that some designers need to confront and own and other people need to know if they're gonna manage designers better um, because uh, Universities are doing a shit job of educating designers. So that's what I've observed and that's what I've heard from industry all over the place. If you're a graduate, you're almost unemployable across most disciplines. Do I have any vested interest in universities? No. Am I about to get a job at university? No. That's the truth. So if you're an industrial designer, you do not come out with job-ready skills. If you're a graphic designer, you do not come out with job-ready skills. Ask any consultancy they know that's the truth. And so we have designers that are coming out thinking that their job is self-expression. That's not their job. That's an artist's job. Your job as a designer is to solve problems. If you've hired a designer who thinks that they're there to self-express, you've got yourself an artist. You need to fire them and get a designer. <laughs> um, here's another thing that goes on. So this is Richard Saul, who, Werman, who, uh, architect, graphic designer, also founded the TED conference. You've probably heard of that. I think this is a great quote. The God of looking good versus the God of being good. Who, which one are you worshipping as a designer? And I say this with love. It's tough love, but it's love. Here's some words that we throw around, some terms, right? There's all of the traditional design disciplines. I've mentioned some of them. 
There's design thinking, um, which is no quick way to sum up, except it's about the worship of post-it notes. So design-led innovation, <laughs> it, it, um, yeah. I'm a supporter and a critic at the same time. So design-led innovation, uh, it's, that's about the role of design in the innovation process, and we'll get to that later. Design integration is about the role of design in competitive strategy. That's all well and good, but to be honest, when I hear a lot of this sometimes, I just go, awkward. <laughs> um, these, these terms, they have their place. They have their place. They're useful to educate people on the distinctions between different concepts. But they end up becoming the end of, end of themselves. People want to be a design thinker because they want to be a design thinker and they want to be design integrated because they want to be design integrated. They want to have design in business because they want to have a design in business. It's a big circular process and it doesn't serve anyone except themselves. So it's actually quite a clever joke when you think about it. Design should be a team sport. Um, this is the part where I'm a wanker and I say that, um, you know, this is kind of part of my attitude about anything, is use what works. Don't be a slave to any given dogma. So uh, moving on from my soapbox part. So design process challenges. So this is the, the UK's uh, double diamond design. Well, say that again. UK Design Council's double diamond. Probably you've seen that before. This won't be new. It's been around for a very long time. It's a very generic description of the design process, which is why I bring it up, because it's very simple. So four stages, I'm not going to go into much detail. On the left side, you're defining the problem. On the right side, you're designing the solution. You're diverging to discover the problem. You're converging to define the problem. You're diverging to ideate and come up with stuff. You're converging to figure out what the right solution is. There's a bit of detail there. There's a bit of build, test, iterate at the back. I think you get the point. This is some of the ways that that design process goes wrong. And this is some of the ways that I've seen this process get abused. So design ignorance, this is the part where you don't actually define the problem at all. You just go, sweet, I'm gonna jump straight into the creative part and design some stuff. And uh, so you're completely ignorant of the problem that you're solving. This is the opposite, where design is actually impotent because you've spent all of your time defining a problem and none of your time doing anything about it. Uh, this is a, also a very common problem because we've got a whole bunch of people who think that they're designers and they are not. A whole bunch of people who are accountants who read a book and love post-it notes. And so if you cannot translate your idea from the first diamond into the second, you are not a designer. You have no business calling yourself a designer. You, if you do not have the ability to take concept and translate it into a product, a service, a space, or some kind of differentiated offering, you're not a designer. You might be very creative, you might be super innovative, you might be very smart, you might add a lot of value, but you, you're not a designer. And it's important we recognize that because otherwise we're not gonna really add any value. You don't get paid for ideas, you get paid for execution. So um, this is the perfectionist. This is the one where you think, oh, geez, I've got to do everything in every stage perfectly to all levels. Um, this is a trap. You're never going to get there. Um, you probably really struggle with this expectation. Uh, it's a, not a great place to put yourself up against and build a culture around. Um, this is a recipe for burnout and hating each other. Um, why? So why is this not a... A good thing to do because it's completely unrealistic. This is data from New Zealand. This is about the number of people who have actually, are actually employed in each one of those stages. So what you're seeing here is not very many people in the first time and loads of people in the second time. Okay, so that's, you can, you can argue that you should even that out and maybe there should be more people in the front. You might be right. I don't have an opinion. That's just the data. I'm just looking for the best data that we have. This might be entirely appropriate. If you're building a skyscraper, you, how many architects do you need versus how many engineers and construction workers? Now, so I don't have much more of an opinion about it. That's just the truth. I think it's probably we should recognize that. 
Uh, here's some other things that we do wrong. So this is, this is every designer loves to, to moan about this because it sucks. Um, and this is the part where you just go, look, I know you think you're all fancy and whatever, but just take this steaming pile and polish it up, please, and make it look a bit pretty or whatever, and then ship it. It's like, oh, gee, thanks, my really feel valued, and I really feel like this is going to work. So we've all done it. I've done it. I didn't like myself very much when I did it, but we've all done it. Um, this is another version, the post-it crack addict. So uh, we've all done this too. So the, the point here is not going, not, it's not a gotcha. It's not like, you're the post-it crack addict. It's, this is about recognizing that we all fall into these traps and they're traps. And you can, all, you can fall into them, but you've got to have some awareness to go, fuck, I'm a post-it crack addict right now. I'm going nowhere. I need to stop. Okay, so it's about awareness. So um, here's another one. So uh, yeah, I've, I have worked in government. And um, so I say this with love and respect with the constraints of government. And if you're trying to innovate in government, it often looks like this. You have a lot of post-it notes and stuff and a lot of workshops, you're really good at workshops if you're in government and stakeholder engagement, which is another, I'm not gonna go any further. So um, a lot of workshops and then not a lot of actually figuring out what's the right problem to solve. Just as long as you do something and, and the courier mail is cool with that, then you're good. <laughs> And then do a lot more workshops and have lots of brainstorms and public engagement and stuff like that, but not actually turn any of them into anything and deliver anything ever because the election's going to come around, so who cares anyway? Um, and this one's a, a fun one. So this, is, this, one, this was what happens when the designers get sick of lipstick on a pig and they go, screw you, client. I'm going to go up this other end here. I'm going to do strategy out the wahoo. I'm going to do so many strategy workshops, you don't even know. And then they're going to go, right, thanks, Mr. Client. Now that I've bamboozled you with my creative workshoppy things and you're out of the room, I'm going to, thanks very much. Now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do very little brainstorming and ideation because I actually think that I know already what to do because I'm so smart. And then I'm going to spend all my time polishing my pixels. So that's a trap. That's very common. Here's one that's, uh, that's for real in Flake. Um, this is also a trap. So this does happen. Uh, it, it sucks when it happens, but it happens. And so this is the part where it's like, oh, we have, a, we're, we're a seasonal business. We do, it's ski schools, North America. So winter is coming. And when winter is coming, Liam is freaking out. So I need to get stuff done fast and sometimes I shortcut the process and um, sometimes that ends up in this part where everybody hates Liam because he's not even as smart as he thought he was and he was totally wrong and now we've got to fix all the things and the devs hate Liam and everybody hates Liam and blah. I want to flip back here a second and recognize a hidden truth here which is why would Liam shortcut that process? One, because Liam's having an ego moment and he's full of himself and he thinks you know, he's better than everyone. And sometimes, two, Liam's full-time job is to have more empathy and more understanding of the customer than anyone else in the room. So if I have that deep immersion and knowledge and expertise, sometimes I can shortcut the process based upon education, based upon experience, based upon deep knowledge and expertise and, and process so that's me giving myself one foot in, one foot out, but it is true. Sometimes you can get away with it if you actually do know what you're talking about, but you walk a real fine line because this sucks. So that's the honest truth um, from my experience. And it's not terribly scalable to have individuals have to make that call, but if you're in a small business, sometimes you have to. So what I'm saying is there's no perfect process. I don't believe in perfection. Anyway, so this is what it looks like at Flake when we're doing stuff fairly well by our standards. So, you know, we might spend a bit of time in the field and do our UX research, engage with the customers, things like that, get a good understanding of where it's at. Then we might kind of go, look, 
we have a fair bit of understanding of ski schools and based upon that and what we've seen, we're gonna narrow in fairly quickly because we don't have a lot of time. And then we might, if we're being good, we might have a couple of weeks to actually scope out and wireframe prototype something and go, okay, could be this concept, could be that concept, let's do some feedback from customers and so on. And then quickly after that, we're gonna lock down and spend most of our time in a fairly iterative process between like finished design and polishing design and development. So that's what it looks like when we're doing something good. There's no perfect, at least not for us. And usually this is when winter is over and the pressure is off. So I don't have the answer to this question um, because it's completely dependent on your business and your situation. There's no magic formula. Um, so these are the questions that you need to ask to figure it out for yourself, what the right balance is for you. And that could change depending on the project. So what kind of business do you want to be? What kind of, what do you need in your business right now? And how does this feature and project relate to that need? Whether that be a commercial need, a customer need, a cash flow need, a brand need, there's, there's all kinds of different needs. They drive what process you, you should be following. The point here is about ego traps. Don't get stuck in a purist point of view. So let's elevate past process and talk about this thing called design lab business, which I've heard people talk about. And I feel like people generally want to be design lab business because it sounds cool. That's my honest assessment. Um, or it's, it sounds cool in like fast company or whatever, or the designers have been in the year. There's not necessarily thought through or not even a clear definition of what that is. So here is a definition from the chairman of the Better By Design program, who was also the CEO of a company called Icebreaker, who are about 200, I think they're about 200 million revenue. They do outdoor adventure um, clothing out of New Zealand. Um, the point, he's got a defin he, definition here about a production led business. So you're building what you can. So if you're in a manufacturing business, for example, you're, you're kind of defined by your tooling. You build what you can because it's too expensive to do anything else. If you're in a marketing led business, then you're, you're analyzing what is, you're doing focus groups, all that kind of stuff, and you're just delivering what they say. He's defining a design-led business as when you're taking an intuitive leap and you're, you're giving people something that they haven't thought of, okay? We'll get into that a bit more, but there's a starting point. So you're dealing with latent needs, so needs that are hidden. It's not customer says, hey, I want this. It's what's hidden under that. Uh, and emerging needs, so things that are coming based upon social or technology trends. And then it's about actual product differentiation, actual differentiation in the product service experience space. So it's not perceived or marketed differentiation, it's actual differentiation over price. So what often is gonna come up here is this is the part where someone's gonna show you a ladder. And we are here on the ladder and you need to, we need to be at the top of the ladder. Why? Every discipline has some kind of capability ladder, whether it's design, marketing, engineering, everyone has some kind of capability ladder. We're not that creative with capability, it seems. So this is the Danish one. There's a top, there's a middle, and there's a bottom. It's not, I'm not even gonna bother. Here's the Envision one. So here's, like, here's what Envision says, they got some data. This is one that we made. So we made a ladder in my program. It's quite similar, it's got, ours is more curvy though. So that makes better differentiation. This is a trap. Um, this is a total ego trap. Everyone just wants to get to the top. It's designed that way. We designed it that way. We were trying to inspire people to join the program. It was, it's, this is a subtle dig at you're not enough. You're not enough, therefore you should want to be more. Why? I don't know, it doesn't matter. So, why should you want to be design-led? Because all of these other models work perfectly fine. Red Bull, they've got a huge business out of, uh, don't they make drinks? Because it doesn't seem like they make drinks. They've got a huge brand that does all kinds of crazy stuff and they seem to be doing pretty good. Marketing, you know, analyzing what is, like we were talking about, analyze what is and then deliver to that. Lots of people, marketing is great. It does a lot of powerful stuff. Sales, so this is the part where the salesperson dominates and the sales is eliciting the requirements and based upon the relationship, or they have to close a deal, there's cash flow or whatever. Sales, in order to do this, in order to hit cash flow, we have to do it. Fair enough. It's not, sometimes you have to do that. 
engineering led. So this is the part where the engineers and they get really smart and they get in a room by themselves and you, you keep them with the mushrooms and you feed them and you don't let them see light and then they come up with something magical like some magical technology box. Changes the world. And then don't worry about the people as long as the technology is good. But sometimes that works. There's plenty of examples where that really, really, really works. Data led, you know, I think in Sydney you've got a great um, talk about that. So data plays a huge role. Product led, uh, you know, where you build everything into the product, sales, marketing, everything is actually built in. The product sells itself. Slack is an example of that. Um, so it's not about which one is better, but often what happens in this conversation is if I choose to be design led for good reasons, this power game comes up. So does design led mean designer led? Are we then gonna be led by designers? And that power game plays out at all levels of the business plays out in the teams, in the scrum, the UX person versus the BA versus the PO versus everyone else. Um, no, we're design led, so that means me, I'm the designer. Plays out at the executive level, and plays out in whoever's at the top, which voice should I listen to most? So it plays out at all levels. It's a huge power game. It doesn't mean designer led. Designers should not lead your business. It should be the person who should lead your business should be the person who's carrying the risk and the responsibility and the biggest and most holistic worldview. Design is just one worldview. You can have a holistic designer and they can lead a business. Airbnb is an example, but it's, it's not designer led. Wouldn't it be better to make decisions collaboratively? Yes, this sounds very, very nice. I like Disney too. Um, this does not work. It doesn't work. This is communism. The problem is people. It just doesn't work. Um, I've seen people try to make it work. And, uh, you know, I've, I've spent time in um, quite a large organization. Very, very, very big. And they were really smart. Lots of good stuff. Lots of good people. You know, agile up the wazoo. So, so design led all these things. Um, but they didn't have a clear what the structure, the organizational structure was. You had a UX function. You had an engineering function. You had a this function, a sales function, a support function, all the different functions, silos. And then if I was in a, in, in a scrum, I'm in a team, I'm the UX person, I report to the, the UX silo head. I also report to the people who lead my project. So I don't, I'm not clear on who I report to to start with. And then at a, at a project lead level, you've got all of these different voices and you've got no clear leader, what happens? yelling at each other, politics, it's Machiavellian, it's crazy stuff. So that's what happens when you don't have a clear leader. You need a clear leader. And who should be the clear leader? That's up to you. So that's up to the skills that you have in the business, the kind of business that you want to be, what is your vision, what is your competitive strategy, what kind of people do you have, who is actually a good leader, who is holistic, should it be a designer? Maybe, but um, there's nothing inherently about a designer that says they should lead. So if we get past this and we go up into aligning with strategy, so this is the Design Management Institute and this is how they talk about design management. So a um, fair bit going on there. I just want to look at um, one, two, three. So differentiating from the competition, designers are all about that all the time. Don't even need to talk about it. Um, man managing and quality and consistency. Designers love a component library, all right? Everyone's posting about their latest component library. Designers all over it, we get it. That first one doesn't get talked about very much. What is the role of design as a function, as a business capability? That's, that's the one I want to talk about. So we talked loads about process, but, pros but we should be talking about competitive strategy. What is the market? that we're going to choose to compete in and how we're going to win. That then drives our positioning and our product strategy. Our organizational strategy is how we organize our people through a good process in order to win our competitive strategy. So we spend all our time in design talking about process. Mm, you kind of, that's why nobody listens to you. So this is, it is a powerful process. It's a great process. It's a great toy, but it's supposed to be used for something else. And this is the problem with design thinking in many of these programs is that you, you're, we're not talking about where we aim the process. So this is what, you know, it, it, it probably should be. We should be 
aiming that process at this a visual representation of what I just said, aiming the process at a particular chosen market segment. Good focus on specific end user needs, driven by good process equals love and money. Okay, that's the simple version. It's not that simple in real life, obviously. That's the words version. Focus equals deep understanding equals deep value. The greater your focus, the greater your understanding, the greater your value. You can't be everything to everyone except if you want to do it really poorly. So in which market will we play and how will you win? So if you translate it into design speak, what that means is, who is the end user customer that I'm going to choose to design for? And what is the, how, what do they deeply need that only we can offer? So there's a lot in those questions. So, um, okay, so at Flake, we do GPS tracking for kids on a ski school. So if they take a lesson, they don't get lost, right? So who is our user? Is it the kid? Is it the parent? Is it the instructor? Is it the supervisor? There's a lot of people there, and depending on who we prioritize, you know, that, that leads to a very different business. Our truth is who we care about is the instructor, and the, more than them, the managers of the business. We're just doing the minimum, because the kid's like, they're four years old, they're almost mute sometimes. They don't know what it is. You just tell them it's a magical robot. And as long as it doesn't get in the way, it's cool. So, so it's not about the kid, it's about the people being able to responsibly look after those kids. So that's our choice. What do they deeply need that only you can offer? Well, nobody else in our market even has GPS tracking. So that's kind of an easy one for us. And how much innovation do you actually need? Do you, do you, do you really need to go out and do something transformational and change the world? You can do that. It's incredibly risky. Or should you just build something that's new to you? Or should you just fix what you have and make some money from that? And there's no good, better, worse, nothing here. It's just what's going to work for you, what's going to work for your business. Um, so I'm going to skip through this quickly. So here are some of the questions that you should be asking so about your business. So how, how tightly defined is your niche around specific end user customers? Do you want to be the best in the world or you just want to be in the world? Do you want to be creating and owning your own market or do you just want to compete in somebody else's? Do you want to create your own intellectual property or do you just want to find some somewhere else and you know, market and support it? And what is the core competency that you need in order to achieve that? There's no right or wrong here. It's just what are your decisions based upon your context? So there's a lot of, there was, there was a huge hype trend for a while about design and save the world. It won't. Design won't even save your business, but it will make it much more powerful if it's lined up right, okay? Design is a powerful tool, um, and, it, it, and its power is proportional to your level of focus in your competitive strategy. Design will never be able to compensate for poor competitive strategy decisions, unless you just want a bit of lipstick on a pig. So better, the, the Kiwis, they did a great thing by calling their program what they did, better by design. Not transform the world by design, which was kind of what my program said, learnings. Um, just make it better, that's, that's enough. Better is pretty good. So here's a couple of um, case studies of what I'm talking about. So just a reminder, so lining a design process up with a specific market segment Here's a different way to think about that. So underneath that process is people and capability, right? So in your business, you probably have a core capability, some capability that if you didn't have, your business would fall apart because it's actually the core thing that drives value for you, okay? That you'll have other functions which you need but are not the core value creation engine. They're not the thing that differentiates you. That's what I mean by core. Now, if we're talking about integrating design, Really, part of it is, how does my design capability relate to my core capability? How does my design capability relate to the core value, the core way that I create value? Okay? So that's what we're thinking about. Do we, let's say, you've got a really good engineering capability. But are you going to use design to inform those engineers on what to build and to point them at the right human problems? 
That's one thing, informant. Are you going to use design to translate that technical wizardry into something polished and beautiful and human and all of that stuff? So there's a relationship there. It's not just about design in and of itself. It's a team game. I'm going to skip that. So here's a couple of stories. So um, th these, I just want to put up front, these stories are circa 2010. This is from my design integration program days. But they're, they're very relevant. So methven, they make showers. They've been around about 100 years in, in New Zealand. Um, they used to be quite, quite basic showers. Uh, uh, sorry, taps and all that stuff, like you'd find at like Suncorp Stadium in the toilets, like that kind of basic. Um, they had a lot of troubles, and then they, had a, a, they went through a program, and they had a look at these questions, and they realized, so if they were to look at showers, Nobody in the world is actually looking at the needs of women in a shower, and women actually make the purchase decision. So they went, hmm, that's my core end user, women. So how would I, if I were to focus on women, what are the unique needs of women that only we can offer? How would I translate that? And also they looked at their core capability. So these guys are really, really smart with water, those engineers. Probably can't see it very well, but on, on the left here, you've got a conventional shower. On the right, you've got a, a methven shower. They're really good at basically smashing water together and making it, that into a satisfying experience while using less water. That's an engineering capability. They use design to better inform how they used that engineering capability and how they translated that into beautiful, not just like, here's the luxury experience, but here's the, you know, um, essential oil infusions in the water and the place where you put your foot on the thing so you can shave your legs. But because most showers, I guess, are designed by men, we would never think to do. They did, and um, people loved it, and they grew like 100 million in five years. They're a publicly listed company. This is uh, another example where, um, so Phil and Ted, you might know, here's a story about why you don't need to be design-led to really build a good business. So their essential insight was, what if I built a stroller with three wheels? It would be really, way more maneuverable and stuff. Okay, but I'm talking about specifically twins, and the, and the one in the back is having a crap time. They can't see anything. Um, yeah, okay, fair enough. That could be a flaw. Phil and Ted's took the position, oh, I don't care that much. So they're... they're I'm being a little irreverent, they're a little irreverent, it's part of their brand. So one of their early um, processes with coming up with their brand was, screw the baby, what about me? As a parent, right? And you think about it with Bugaboo and all those guys, all the, all the photography and all the imagery of all, all of the competitors, it's always about the baby, like, look at that fat little cheek, so it's so cute, la 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 la. And not like the frazzled, like, you know, half suicidal parent that's <laughs> behind them. So, so it's like, so that, and the baby doesn't buy this bloody thing anyway, so what's am I doing? So that was their core thing, and you kind of see that. I want to, I'm a modern mum, I don't want to be stuck at home in my maid's outfit or whatever from the 50s, I want to be getting out and having a life. I want, I'm a modern dad, it's about me, I'm, I'm enlightened and having a peaceful zen moment over here. So, great insight, they build a brand around that, it's really irreverent, people love that, great brand story. Then. They had a relationship with a channel partner. I, I don't know who it was. Let's, let's pretend it's Bunnings because I can't think of anything better to say. Let's pretend it's Bunnings. So I've got a really sweet stroller and a really great brand. I have access to Bunnings. You don't, whoever you, the competitor is. You build other baby things. I don't want you in Bunnings. So what am I going to do? Flood Bunnings with all kinds of other baby stuff. So. Now they do all kinds of other baby stuff. They do whatever that is. I don't have kids, so I'm rubbish at this. <laughs> um, and whatever that is about the feeding and the chairs and the sitting. So <laughs> the, the point is, did they, did they have some incredible like latent or emerging insight to transform into a cot or into a chair or into a tent? No, they didn't. There's, not, there's no huge product innovation there. There's just a cool brand, and that brand visual language has been applied to, eh, it's probably an okay product, it's not a great product, right? But it served their competitive strategy. They had an, a, a commercial objective, which is block the competition from their channel partner. That was the role of design. 
did the designers kick up a stink and say, what about the humans or, I don't know, capitalism is bad or something? Maybe, but they had a job at the end of that conversation. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I disclaim, I have no idea. Sorry, Phil and Ted, if you listen, I, I, I have no truthful understanding of what I just imagined. That's funny in my head. So here's Flake. Um, so we do technology for ski schools in North America. We do hardware with the GPS and the tracking and kids not dying on the mountain. And then also um, we do management software. So just like management of any other business, whether it's property or any other kind of business you might have, you've got admin functions, management functions. We do that. We just do it for people who like sliding down a mountain. Um, that's what that looks like. So we've been around like 12 years. Um, here's the decisions that we had to make. Basically, um, we had the GPS stuff. We had a bunch of good engineers. We had recognition in the market. We had some really early management products that were kind of crap. Um, but we, were, we didn't have any competition. And we were at a point where we had to decide what to do next. So, you know, so I was looking at the same kind of stuff. So like, what, are, what is our core capability? Well, it's engineering, but it's quite reactive. It's not really guided very well. Um, it's kind of driven by whatever the customer wants. And sure, we can do that. Um, and then, you know, we had this underutilized strength with real-time data. We know where the instructor and the people are on the mountain at all times. We also have all of the management functions to tell you where all of those instructors, where they got paid, when they worked who was good, who wasn't good, who had people coming back. So we had all the data, but we weren't doing anything with it. We also, and nobody else was doing anything with it, and that all lined up with the fact that the ski instructors, the ski supervisors and managers, were just dealing with piles of paper everywhere and trying to manage by piles of paper and legwork and experience and intuition. So nobody was joining all the dots. We had all the dots, we could join them. So. That was how we made our decision. Focus on its niche, ski schools, use our core capability, but inform design, use design to inform that core capability, leverage it, communicate it. So that was our strategy. Um, that's just a repeat. So that's, that was what that looked like. So we're trying to make ski schools simpler. We're trying to give people visibility and tools in real time. Simple management tools, smart data. So, um, that's the design story of Flake. Um, there's all kinds of other things that we could talk about. I'm just trying to use that as a way of illustrating how you can navigate some of those decisions. Do we have the most beautiful design in the world? No. <laughs> have we like cut corners all over the place? Yes. Do, do our designers sometimes go, man, this sucks, this product. I wish I could do it better. I'm not putting this in my portfolio. Yes, they're sitting up the back, I'm going to dog in later. But um, did, we, did we ship stuff that people actually really loved and used? Yes. Is it to our high standards as designers, as a high standard design culture? Sometimes no. But these are the realistic trade-offs that you have to make. It's not, this is not about dribble design, this is about real design. So I'm going to wrap up there. Um, this is, so I'm just going to skip through and because I've run out of time here, but this is really the conclusion I'm hoping we're getting to, is that who should lead customer empathy as long as it's lined up with what will actually work for your business. Because if you're prioritizing your customer over you, sooner or later, you're not gonna have a job. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm hoping we can do is better manage our design process, better integrate our design strategy, get the, e you're never gonna get the ego out of the room, but at least acknowledge the ego, hey, here's the bit where I'm doing the post-it crack addict, here's the bit where Liam's just pulling a tyrant, um, and make some more progress, and hopefully as a result of all of that, serve the world better, which is you know, what we all aspire to as, as creatives and innovators anyway, so thank you. Thanks, Liam. Um, really, really amazing uh, topic and talk. I've just been monitoring Slido. Um, if you want to hop on again with your phone, sli.do, hashtag product tank, and ask some more questions. 
uh, that'd be fine. But the few did pop up there that I thought were relevant um, to you. First is, how did we come to have a ski school platform based in sunny, no snow, Brisbane, Australia? Yeah, um, the Sunshine State. <laughs> so, I don't have a good answer. I've got a real answer, I guess. I, I, I don't. So, the story that I heard, I, I'm four years in. I wasn't, the company started 10 years ago. The story I heard was two mates were in a pub, and one of them was a space nerd. He wanted to go to, he wanted to be an astronaut, wanted to go to space camp. Um, instead, he was in a pub and they were arguing about who could ski faster. And being a space nerd, the answer to that is satellites. So it's like, well, if I put a thing on, I'm gonna track you, GPS with a satellite, and then we'll know for sure. So then they did that, and that's how it got started. They, they were like, I'm gonna ta we're gonna tag each other and see who goes faster. Um, that didn't work out, nobody wants to pay for that. So at some point, our customers told us we need to do safety instead of that. So we pivoted. Uh -huh. yeah. Awesome. Another question, I think, um, which is one that only you could answer, is just the comment you had on the ability of universities to produce design talent. If you just want to unpack that for a few more seconds for us, kind of what what observations did you base that comment on? Um, the where, where why do I say that? Because everyone I ever speak to in industry says that. Maybe if, if that's, I don't know if that's coming from a university person, but if it is, maybe you need to speak to some people in the industry and find out. Um, because I've never spoken to an industry person who's gone, shit, these graduates are good. Like, it's not, it just doesn't happen. So I'll give you an example. So this is an industrial design example. Um, so, you know, I worked at CMD. I'm not, I'm not a designer, by the way. I'm a product manager and I'm an advocate for design. I'm not a designer. So... CMD, you know, those guys, they're 15 years deep, you know, 20 years experience as an industrial designer. When they were educated, it was a five year degree. And they started and they had to learn about material science, they had to learn about like, you know, engineering, they had to learn about art history, you know, they had to learn about serious like science and engineering stuff. It was a real renaissance education. Why? Because you have to turn your post-it notes into something really complicated to be mass manufactured at scale at a predictable cost. You know, I was, because I'm a nerd, I was watching Elon Musk videos and, you know, he was talking about when you launch that car, he goes, you know, designing a car is easy. What's hard is the production system that builds that, that produces that car over and over and over. Getting an industrial designer straight out of school who actually knows how to even use CAD to design something is challenging. Because um, they're all about the first diamond. They're, not, they're losing their core as designers. They're becoming post-it note crack addicts and they're losing the ability to translate. So that, I think that's the, I would generalize that across, um, but you know, I, I actually don't know what it's like for graphic design at the moment, but it used to be um, print design. It's just all about print and traditional graphic. And so if you're looking for somebody who is more product oriented, more UX and product, they don't have that capability. You know, they, there's such a, a divide there. Yeah. So probably the last question for you is, um, having come from a design background and then moved into head of product, talk about how you negotiated that transition. And is there anything that you did or didn't do two years ago that you're doing now as a head of product? Yeah. Um, first answer is poorly. How did I transition poorly? Um, I guess I was, I was fortunate in some ways that I was working in, in, in two consultancies that were very product oriented anyway. And we didn't, neither consultancy at that time employed product managers, but we talked about product management. We talked about product managing things and things that would guide impact because we wanted to be partners, not just brief takers. We wanted to be partners, not just consultants. So we were talking about data, blah, blah, blah. So I guess I had a, a head start because I was working with smart consultants. Um, but the transition from consultant to someone accountable is, is a big one. Um, everyone wants their opinion to be heard, but nobody wants to be accountable when that decision goes wrong. Um, so that's, that's one thing. 
Um, something that I didn't do two years ago that I'm doing more of now, I, I think this is a generalization for Australia, we're way better at building than talking. So we're a really smart country of engineers and people that build stuff. We're not that great at actually at brand, at marketing, at sales, at commercialization. We just kind of think that if we build it, they will come, which is total, total nonsense. It's total nonsense. So um, that's part of why I think the Kiwis kick the crap out of us and, and from, in a manufacturing point of view. They have no domestic market. They do not have the luxury of a 20 million, 20 million people population that they can just market to in a lazy way because they're just around the corner, oh, oh mate, we'll buy it. They, don't, they have to ship it and be internationally competitive from day one. So they really need to differentiate. They really need to communicate clearly. We don't, we're kind of lazy. We just think, oh, that's a bit of bullshit. Oh, I don't want to be a wanker. I don't want to talk myself up. Yeah, that's why nobody buys your stuff. So I think that's, that's a generalization of Australian culture that I've observed. It's also a generalization of me. So, um, you know, for the first two years of, of Flake, you know, we, we had an ambition, ambitious product vision and we n really never had many staff. Like we had a, a team of six at our, at our highest in terms of a product team. So no people, huge ambition. Maybe that was a poor decision to start with. Um, but we spent all of our time, I spent all of my time, we spent all of our time as a business trying to build great stuff. And cash flow is king. And if you really, I realized at some point that the real issue was no longer the product. The real issue was um, our pricing. How do we price? How do we package our product? How do we market it? How do we actually, what does the product marketing and sales process look like? Who are we even talking to in that process? Who are the stakeholders in that process? What are their needs? Because all we were focused on was the people that use the product. And the purchase process was entirely, entirely different. You know, um, if I can say one thing, it's don't confuse your customer and your user for your purchase decision maker. Because if you do, you're in for a rough ride. So um, I spent a lot more time in the last year to um, focusing on all of that. And um, I really wish that I had done that a lot, lot earlier. And um, I would almost start there.